And now, you're tuned in to RBLR, the home of Tampa Bay's Reveler Sports. Hey guys, how's it going? Hope everyone's having a great week. Hope everyone's having a good, you know, good day, good night, whatever you're listening to it. Um, it's been a super, super duper eventful week, and we've got an eventful show coming up to match that energy. Uh, we got Greg Allman coming on a little later. Um, you know, he's he's the guy when it comes to Buck Sports. I, I grew up reading him with the Tampa Bay Times, you know, with the Athletic, now with Fox Sports. He's been all over. Um, so it, he was all, he's going to be awesome. He's going to do great. It's going to be really cool to have him on. But first, um, we'll introduce our co-host, uh, Musab Tariq. Say what's up to the people for me, brother. What's going on, RBLR Nation? What's going on, fans, friends, family? Um, yeah, it's always good to be back. Um, you know, for all our fans out there, you already know what's going on with all these moves, with the whole league, especially the NFC South. We got a lot to talk about, and I look forward to that. And um, all I have to say is it's not over just yet. All right. Keep your head up, ladies and gentlemen. All right. I know t- Tom Brady's gone, but hopefully things will work out. It ain't gonna it ain't gonna be all sunshine and rainbows, but We'll see what works out. But that being said, I shall pass the mic on to Mr. Zach Blaine, who's also in the house right now, repping that TV Tampa Bay Rays. Always. Always. Yeah. All right. How are we feeling? Hey, you know what? I'm feeling great. I am actually currently on vacation. I'm in the beautiful state of Florida. Finally, it's been almost a year since I've been here. So happy to be back, man. And just I'm super pumped about the the about Greg coming on. I think it's going to be amazing. And and the one thing I will say is, Musab, I'm gonna need a little, a little more energy from you, man. I mean, a little more, a little more hype. Okay. Hopefully, <laughs> uh, hopefully, maybe Carter will hype me up a little bit more with this agenda we got cooking up. Yeah. yeah. All right, we'll see what we talk about. All right. Yeah. I mean, like I said, like we've been saying, a lot has happened over this past week for the Bucks. So, um, you know, we'll start with the biggest news, arguably, because you know it's the biggest position. We've been talking it to death. The quarterback position. Um, you know, finally the Bucks have made a move and they brought in Zach's boyfriend, his man crush Monday. Uh, you know, his his celebrity crush. He's probably on the list of you know, Hall Pass, the celebrities. Oh, there. Definitely. Definitely. Um, so, so you know, we're talking about Baker Mayfield, in case you couldn't pick up on that. Um, he has signed a one-year deal with the Bucks. Um, just kind of a prove it deal, just giving him a chance to, you know, rejuvenate his career because it's been on a downturn. All jokes aside, it hasn't been a great past few years for Baker and the Browns, the Panthers and the Rams. Um, you know, it's you went from first overall pick to getting waived by the Carolina Panthers, which is never, never a good sign. Um, but what are, what are y'all's initials feelings about this? Is Baker a legitimate threat to Trask? I mean, I can't imagine that they signed Baker without some, some, some uh, you know, just telling them, hey, you know, some assurances, hey, you're going to be able to compete for this starting spot. Um, Zach, we'll start with you. I mean, do you feel like Zach, uh, excuse me, do you feel like Baker really has a legit shot to take this starting role? Oh, 100%. I think that if if it was already Kyle Trask's team, 100%, they would have drafted a seventh round quarterback and, and not pay. I mean, Baker's contract is not one that he has to start. Like, it, it is a small enough contract that if if for some reason Trask wins the job, then it's reasonable for him to be the backup. For sure. But I don't think you bring in a 27-year-old former first-round pick to be guaranteed a backup spot. Like if I were Baker, I wouldn't have come. So I, I do think that it is a legitimate competition. Uh, and if we're going off of experience, I think Baker has that that little bit of a head start over him. And I'm happy about it. I, I will stand by that forever. <laughs> right. I mean, look, Baker Mayfield's a playoff quarterback. You know, we yeah. can hit on him all we want, but he led the Browns to the playoffs a couple of years ago. So, you know, we can't yeah. take can't take that away from him. Um, and so he just, he, like you said, he has way more experience than Trask. It's very much a more solidified role in the NFL. He's had the snaps. Um, when we stop, how about you? Do you feel differently? Do you still feel like maybe Trask is still the, the head guy? I, I know that's probably not the case because – you know, your feelings about Kyle Trask are very well known. I still want to hear it from the horse's mouth. How are we How are we feeling about it? The signing of Baker Mayfield was rather very, uh, I would say, probably discouraging for Trask fans. Um, I will say this as well. You know, looking at the coaching staff, it, it, it doesn't seem like they really have that much confidence 
and Kyle Trask. Uh, from my point of view, all I'm thinking is, listen, it's not going to be all sunshine and rainbows, as I've already mentioned before. But as long as he gets, you know, Baker Mayfield gets his targets to Evans and Godwin, hopefully we make something happen. And that's where I'm kind of just leaning towards as of right now, you know. I'm not all, you know, you know, happy and jolly with the signing of Baker Mayfield, but I am just – I'm a firm believer that experience outweighs anything else. I don't care what, you know, Kyle Trask did in college. It's been two years. But he's played, what, like 10 minutes of some actual football? You know what I'm saying? So, again, it's just – he didn't beat Gabber for the second string position, which is one thing. On top of that, he barely got any playing time. And now we're looking at a Baker Mayfield signing, which isn't really anything special, but it just shows me desperateness from the coaching staff and the rest of our organization as to how we really see Kyle Trask. And, you know, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this. You know, maybe we'll start out going 50-50 Mayfield and Trask, maybe just in the beginning of the season, but someone's going to have to win this. It's Kyle Trask's battle to lose, or actually, I take that back. It's really Baker Mayfield's battle to lose. Uh, Kyle Trask is, I guess, still going to be there or whatever. He'll just be the second string, and I guess all that. But I don't know. You know, I mean, you know, just so real real quick. Like that. Hey, what's up? When you say 50-50 to start the season, are you meaning like preseason, or, or do you think that there's going to be like a quarterback t- uh, snap share I'm thinking, I'm thinking like to... more preseason, okay. and then we'll still give a fair chance if it's kind of like 60, 40, 40, 60, or whatever. Um, I, I still think that, you know, each one of those gentlemen should have a chance at least early on in the season, preseason, and maybe we'll sprinkle that first game or whatever. But we need, we need to find just someone who can make at least something happen. I don't care if it's Baker Mayfield, Kyle yeah. Trask, or if it's Carter Brantley, all right, if they sign him tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? So all I right. guess my my rebuttal to that, though, is do you think that a split quarterback room, like starting quarterback, is, is the best play as far as building up confidence for either one of those guys? I think it's a good confidence builder, but I don't think how much of a confidence builder is in our priority list when it comes to seeing how we do. It's a possibility, Zach, just because I I do think that we are in a rebuilding phase. But with Kyle Trask, I think we are more of in a more of a rebuilding phase. I feel like they'll start more over. Um, but I have to say, it's just this is this how I feel right now, Zach. Zach, it, it could just yeah, turn out that Baker yeah. Mayfield still continues to, you know, exemplify why he gets passed around like a little rag doll, you know, from team to team or whatever. You know what I'm saying? So, and then Tras takes the role. It's really, it's really both of their battle right now. I, I, I think it's fair as we speak as of today, March 15th, but uh, – more than ever, I, I think this is just a battle we're going to have to see, you know, during practices and the preseason and all that. But what I am hoping, ideally, is whether it's Trask or Mayfield, is we have a firmer idea as to who we want to go with. I don't want this whole 50-50 situation or even a, a 60-40. I'm leaning more 70-30 or 80-20. I don't care who it is, but if these are the two guys we're going to have right now, then so be it. But... um Whoever it is, I mean, I just hope it works out. That's all I really have to say. You know, we we still have some veterans on our team. Uh, we're trying to retain as much as possible, but we're having some issues. You know, we're losing our guys. But I'll leave it at that. I want to see where y'all heads at with this whole situation as well. For sure. I mean, the, the, the best quote I can think of is, um, when you have – or how many quarterbacks do you have when you have two quarterbacks? You have no starting quarterbacks. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's that kind of whole thing. If you have to split snaps like that or if you have to keep going back and forth, then you don't have any starting caliber quarterbacks. Um, you see it all the time in college. Um, you see college teams go through this um, where they have two guys that they think could maybe be starters, and so they kind of go back and forth, and then both of them just end up being really bad. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's brutal. You know, it's, it's kind of a tough problem to have. Um, at the NFL level, because there's not this change of pace that there is in college. Like you don't bring in a guy to kind of, you know, the saints tried that with Taysom Hill and look at where it got them. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it's going to be hard. Um, like y'all said, you don't bring in Baker Mayfield 
on this deal without some assurances that he's going to have to, you know, he's going to have a chance to compete for this starting job. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it'll just be something that you have to see play out. The preseason is going to be huge. Um, we'll see how it goes moving forward. Um, but another big news, big piece of news that came out of the Bucks uh, was Shaq Mason being traded. It's not maybe not what everyone's talking about, but I think it's pretty big just because this offensive line was one of the worst in football last year. They had an awful, awful time protecting Tom Brady. And, you know, if Kyle Trask is the quarterback this season, which probably not, but let's say he gets thrown in there, he's just as as mobile as Tom, as immobile as Tom Brady. So, you know, you're going to have to have good offensive line play. And Shaq Mason was a pretty solid guard in the NFL and they traded him for a pick swap. Um, so, I mean, how do, what do the Bucks do with this offensive line now? I mean, do they move Luke Gadecki to right tackle and Worfs to left? I mean, there's a lot of changes that could happen. Robert Hainsey, I mean, could he move to left guard? And I don't know. There's just a lot of question marks. <laughs> with the line. Um, so, Zach, we'll start with you. What do you think they do with this offensive line now? Yeah, I, I think it shows that Tampa has a little bit of faith in their younger offensive linemen. Um, we obviously, I don't remember exactly how, but we gave something to Nick, uh, Levert. Yep. Nick Levert. Yep. Keep him around. Um, so I think that they have faith in, in both Nick and Robert Hainsey. Um, I've seen on the Pat McAfee show that Robert Hainsey's out there working out with, uh, AQ Shipley. And so I think that they both are going to be better this year. And I think that we could see legitimately both of them on the offensive line this season. Yeah, absolutely. And they brought back Aaron Steiny, the Super Bowl starter. Um, so, you know, they've got some guys out there. It's just, yeah, we'll just have to see how it goes. Um, you know, they can't, you can't have, <laughs> Ryan Jensen can't get hurt again this year. That's all I'll say. Yeah, yeah uh, if he does, we're, we're in serious trouble. Absolutely. Um, Musab, how about you? What do you think about maybe Werfs moving to the left side of the line, you know, moving to left tackle? I think this is another example of trial and error, as we were discussing with our quarterback situation, uh, especially in regards to the whole, you know, kind of Shaq Mason deal that happened. Um, the situation is, you know, we're, we're, you know, we've freed up some money. Uh, you know, we got some guys like Hainsey, Leverett, and, you know, we got Stinney as well, uh, who's, you know, going to be more of a less ex expensive option. Uh but I do think there's a possibility of taking up a guard, you know, during this upcoming NFL draft. Uh, I think we have some things to work on, of course. Um, when I say rebuilding year, I do think that it's going to be more of a rebuilding year, more with our offensive line. Uh, I think the offense is a big priority right now as to what's happened recently with our, you know, Buccaneers organization and with the news that's come on out. Um, that's really about it. Yeah, that's what I'm looking at right now. Uh, with the situation that we're looking at right now, Carter and Zach, I am, you know, kind of just, I'm fine with it. You know, if, if that's what we have to do, that's what we have to do. You know, I, I don't think that, you know, it's, this is some kind of idiotic decision. Uh, we're just working with what we have right now. Well, obviously, you know, with the whole cap space issue that we've been dealing with and just everything else, you know, it's, it's hard knowing that, you know, Tom Brady's left your team. You know, we're not the same caliber kind of, you know, Buccaneers as we were a couple of years ago. So we are in for a treat, but let's see what goes on. I do like the kind of young kind of, you know, picking up young players, young studs and all that. It's just going to be more of a long-term project. But my only fear is I just hope that we're not keeping, you know, we're not changing these young guys you know every year or so you know what i'm saying just because it's just gonna continue to be a working project over and over you know what i'm saying you're looking for guys that you know are hoping to stay on the team or hoping to actually you know create an impact you know within this organization and um yeah you see from a few guys but then again you don't see from others so there are some names out here on our team um from the top of my head, I don't want to just pick, you know, pick point or whatever, but um, there's some changes to be needed to be made. But I have to say, uh, offensive line is definitely on my list, you know, when it comes to the whole NFL draft situation, right? Uh, especially with the Shaq Mason trade as well. Uh, Absolutely. I think yeah. that is a sign that we are definitely trying to do something with the offensive line for sure. 
Yeah, I mean, the draft is going to be huge, especially, like you said, for this offensive line, just because even just for depth purposes, you know, they'll need some backups because Ryan Jensen might get hurt, uh, you know, God forbid. But, um, yeah, the, the depth is going to be important. And like you said, continuity, just finding guys that – can you know what made this Bucks offensive line or the Bucks offensive line Super Bowl great was just you know they were there for a while those guys had been together as a group for like several years so there was a lot of chemistry there so you know the the fact that they're going to have to continue to kind of shuffle guys in and out it's definitely a difficult thing to deal with that's a great point um, so another big piece of news from the Bucks this past week Jamel Dean he's back um, I don't think anybody saw it coming. Um, I certainly didn't. I, I figured, all right, Jamel Dean's gone. That's okay. Yeah. But he played a great, great season. He's going to go get paid. Good for him. Um, but instead, the Bucks were, man- were able to bring him back, um, you know, a four-year deal. Um, and this kind of frees up their draft picks because, you know, they were going to probably have to pit- spend a first-round pick on that corner position without Jamel Dean coming back because Carlton Davis and Zion McCollum ain't going to get it done. Um, so – you know, what What do you think they do with this? You know, kind of obviously Jamel Dean signing is huge, but even from a bigger picture standpoint, what does this do for the first round pick? Um, do you think they still go secondary because they have Antoine Winfield and no one else at the safety position um, on the roster right now? Or do you think maybe they shift to offensive line or wide receiver or any other plethora of options? Zach, we'll start with you. Yeah, I don't know. I think it's too early to tell because – the free agency window, like I know the legal tampering period started, I believe, on Monday. But right. free agency just started, what, yeah. at 4 o'clock today, I think. So I think it's too early to tell. The Jamel Dean signing is huge. It, it's probably uh, – I tweeted about it a few times. In my opinion, the he was our number one free agent to bring back. Absolutely. Um, because I think that we were very, very thin at, at corner. Do I think that that means we don't draft a corner in the in the draft? No, because I think that let's say hypothetically, um, any of the top two or three quarter or cornerbacks slip to us, I'm taking them. Like it's not even a, a question because I think that good teams have three solid cornerbacks. Maybe not you know Pro Bowl level guys, but I I do think that you need a good slot guy. You need a good a good and then two good outside guys. So I don't think that it eliminates the need for a corner in my opinion, but I do think that it opens it up more to essentially taking the best available player. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and that's a great point. This, this is still going to be a position they have to address simply just to fill the roster out with bodies at the position. Um, Cause you know, Zion McCollum and D Delaney are the only two other active cornerbacks right now on the roster. Yeah. Other than yeah. David and Dean. So they got to get a fifth guy um, because I'm, I don't feel comfortable with McCollum or Delaney playing meaningful snaps at the cornerback position. Exactly. Delaney, special teams guy, but, and, and McCollum's just still, you don't really know what you got with them. So I'm with you. I'm with you. It's still definitely a position they're going to need to address. Uh, Musab, how about you? Maybe you feel a little bit more strongly that they avoid the cornerback position in the early rounds because of this signing. I am. Oh, how do I say this? I'm, I'm fine with them avoiding it during the early rounds of the draft, but I, I still think that it is definitely uh, a position needing to be looked into. Uh, as both of y'all mentioned right now, uh, obviously, yeah, look, you know, we got Dean, you know, back, uh, we, you know, we cleared a ton of cap space, you know, a few days ago with, you know, Godwin and Vita Vea and a few others contracts and, you know, we're cutting guys or leasing guys like Shaq Mason. Uh, so, uh, I don't think that, you know, having, you know, needing to draft a secondary is one of the top priorities, but I do think that it is definitely something we need to focus on. Um, I think that more than ever, uh, you know, within these last, I don't know, three, four years, guys, I think this year it is very important that we really look into, you know, these guys we're drafting. All right. You know, um, you know, clearly I, 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 we, we didn't talk about the draft results last year altogether, us three. And the year before we did and the year before we didn't either. All right. But I have to say, in my opinion, I think that this this upcoming draft result is going to be very feisty, and if the Buccaneers don't do it right, or as we were expecting, I think we're going to have a lot to talk about. Seriously, I think the the spotlight is on the Buccaneers. 
we are one of the few teams right now that have had a you know some really good times in the past and then we're on this we are on a potential downfall we're not on a downfall just yet you know not just yet it could happen it couldn't we might just be mediocre that's where i'm kind of thinking about right now you know where do we want to stand i'm i i'm thinking more mediocre obviously i want to be the best we can but hopefully yeah i don't want to go on the downfall just because of our crappy picks all right so that's why i'm thinking um I'm really happy with this whole Jamel Dean signing just because of his age and talent. He seems more like a biggest, you know, like, or like a bigger re-sign to us than Levante David. Uh, but, you know, I don't think Levante David is going to be around for more than another year or two. Uh, and um, I also don't think that, you know, our other veterans are really as talented as Jamel Dean. This was kind of a steal for me. So I'm really, really happy with this. I think this was really big. And I have to ask, I mean, you know, minus just the whole Levante David and Jamel Dean thing that we got on back with us, you know, is there anything ideally that you guys are looking at during this offseason minus the draft to happen, you know, maybe position-wise or maybe player-wise? Um, I'd love for them to bring in another veteran interior defensive lineman. Um, I feel like Logan Hall kind of needs that mentorship that Vita Vea got, um, and I feel like it would be huge for his development. Um, you know, and and so was kind of that way for Vita Vea. And, uh, you know, they had Akeem Hicks this past season. So I just think that bringing in another veteran presence would be huge. Zach, how about you? Do you have any other any other ideas like that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I agree with you 100 uh, percent. I know a, a name that I want brought in, a, a, just kind of a random name to me. Uh, you, I think, Carter, you know who I'm talking about. <laughs> Do I? Uh, you should. Oh, well, I think I should, but, you know, I still want to hear you say it. <laughs> no, I want – I want. Uh, I, I know we're kind of talking more defensive side, but I want Ezekiel Elliott brought in. Oh, <laughs> I, no. I had, no. To, I had to say it. It's going to happen. I, I, I don't know if it's going to happen, like, for real, but I want it to happen. Uh, so I, I think as far as bringing in, like, a veteran presence, I think that he's someone who's – I mean, he's hit that, that kind of probably where he starts to decline in his career, but – Sorry. He's a bad I mean, like kind of it kind of gives me like Baker Mayfield signing like uh -huh, the way yeah. we signed Ezekiel. Oh, I guess who was behind the bring Baker to Tampa movement. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh man. Man, you go, yeah, man. You all Baker and Zeke, huh? Yeah, oh 100 you know, percent okay. hey, on our team? If this was 2020, I'd be so excited for Baker Mayfield and Ezekiel yeah. Elliott. It is 2023. Like Ezekiel Elliott hasn't had a pretty, he got, he, he got his, his job stolen last year. You know, like okay, Tony, Pollard. Tony Pollard is so good. Like okay, and Ezekiel Elliott is so bad. And he, he is not so bad. I'm telling you, bro, him and Rashad White, Rashad White had trouble between the tackles last season. You can't deny that. He was not great between the tackles last for sure, season. For sure, right. Ezekiel Elliott is way better than him between the tackles. Right. Really the only benefit I'm not that going to have on the Buccaneers is just mentoring Richard White. Ezekiel Elliott is seeming more like a coach to me more than an actual player at this point. Absolutely. I think he has. And there's nothing wrong with that. Look what he, look what he did to Tony Pollard. Do not align oh. with his knowledge. And I'm not trying to give. I'm not trying to give Ezekiel Elliott for Tony Pollard's success. Come on now. Well, that's I mean, that's <laughs> like saying we can't give anyone credit for anyone's success then. <laughs> like, like Dave Canales or however you pronounce his last name doesn't get any of Geno Smith's credit. That, that seems wild to me. No, I'm, I'm with you. Look, I don't mean to hate on Ezekiel. It's just, you know, he's been really unproductive for the amount of money that he's been getting paid from the Dallas Cowboys. So, and, and I have the feeling that he's not going to just settle for a minimum deal. You know, he's going to want to get four or five million dollars and spending four or five million dollars on Ezekiel Elliott with the cap constraints that the Bucks have just well, doesn't seem like a super smart thing to do. Does, is Because I don't think he's technically been released, at least not when we started recording the show. I don't think he had been technically released yet. Are you right? But right. if he gets released... Doesn't he still gets money? So he could sign for the veteran minimum and still be making uh, essentially what he would have been making this year on Dallas. Sure, I mean that's a good point. And if he's trying to get playing time, then the Bucks have nothing but that to offer him. So exactly. that's a good point. Um, yeah. So if they're if he's willing to take the veteran minimum, absolutely, one hundred percent, I'm on board. Um, but if they're having to pay a little bit more for him, I don't know. Um, but you know what I don't doubt is that the RBLR shop, you know. 
I'm rocking it right now, the Live and Lavish t-shirt. And uh, they got some fire threads there. Um, there's no Ezekiel Elliott or Baker Mayfield type threads on that store. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but you got to check it out. Shop at sports.com. Um, enter in the promo code Cannons, C-A-N-N-O-N-S, for 10% off everything in the store. Um, Ray's gear, Buck's gear, Lightning gear, Rowdy's gear, they got it all. Um, so definitely take a peek. All right, guys. So as we discussed, we're going to have a very special guest on today, uh, Greg Allman from Fox Sports. Uh, say hello. Um, introduce yourself. Say where we can find you. What's up, Greg? <laughs> hey, guys. Thanks for having me on today. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at my name, Greg Allman, G-R-E-G-A-U-M-A-N. And everything I write is at uh, foxsports.com. Absolutely. I mean, if, if they're listening to this show, they've heard of you. Um, everyone's heard of you. <laughs> but, uh, we'll get right into it. You know, we certainly want to be straight to the point. Um, kind of the first question or topic that we wanted to discuss um, was really just about uh, the Shaq Mason deal. Um, it was a big, for me at least, it was kind of a big deal because the Bucks kind of have a lot of, balls in the air when it comes to the offensive line. Uh, so we wanted to hear what, what your thoughts were about the Shaq Mason deal and how it changes the Bucks' offensive line moving forward. Yeah. I mean, I think the main thing is, is obviously the Bucks are kind of in a crunch for cap space right now. Um, and I don't think they necessarily want to lose Shaq Mason, but it's just one of those positions where because they have a couple of young linemen they like, uh, you can trade him away, shed the salary and pick up about $5 million in cap space and still have somebody you like at the position. And it's kind of like they'd rather do that than, than lose somebody or miss out on a free agent. Um, the, the cap space for, I mean, honestly, even like a Baker Mayfield takes up less space than the cap space for Shaq Mason. So it, it's kind of like there's a drop-off, and it, obviously you're, you're losing a, a proven starter in your offensive line, a guy that played well from last year. But uh, whether it's a Robert Hainsey or a Luke Gedeke or even a Brandon Walton that steps in there or a draft pick, uh, I think they'll kind of take their lumps there if it means they have some flexibility to be able to get the guys they want. So Shaq Mason, it's nothing against Shaq Mason. It's just one of those where if you have a guy with some flexibility to make a move, um, that $5 million goes a long way this week. So uh, tough for him to, to be gone and going to Houston, but uh, he'll do fine there. Absolutely. Um, Zach, did you have a topic for him? Uh, yeah. So um, with, I mean, you mentioned the draft. Does, does the signings that we've had so far, as far as Jamel Dean and, and the trades, like getting rid of, of Shaq Mason, it kind of seems like we're going younger on the offensive line. Do you think this affects how we were going to draft at 19 as opposed to three days ago, what everyone was thinking? I don't think so. I mean, the, the big thing with that first draft pick was was trying to figure out kind of what the biggest holes would be created by the losses in free agency. So if they'd lost Jamel Dean, I would have said corner moves up to the top of the list. If Levante David wasn't back, I would say they got to find an inside linebacker. Uh, and that might be a match for that 19 pick. But because they got those two guys back, those those become less immediate needs. Um, I think they could still draft either position just because um, you, you can use depth at both positions. I think. <laughs> yeah. but, uh, but that's one of those where, I mean, if they you know guard, not necessarily, I think they have some better options in-house there than they have existing depth at a couple of those spots. We still don't know guys like Mike Edwards and Sean Murphy Bunting and a bunch of others that are – right now but probably you're going elsewhere um they're going to want to replenish those guys too so yeah i mean even going back to donovan smith being gone um if there's a tackle they really like that they feel like they could step you know have come in and a one be a starter a tackle um whether that's left side or right side or whatever you know you, you want that that number one pick that top pick to be somebody that you like at a position where they can step in and play a lot we don't know what that position is yet Right. Absolutely. And kind of bouncing off that draft draft discussion. Um, so 19 is kind of an awkward position. You know, it's, it's kind of one of those weird, you're not quite high enough to get a really, really big difference maker, but you're not quite low enough to really trade back or anything. But speaking of trading back, do you think that's an option on the table for the Bucks? Um, is that kind of the ideal situation, them trading back from 19? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think Jason Light has shown if, if the right guy isn't there, um, he'll kind of make a calculated move back. I mean, they did that last year. Uh, moving back a little bit. They did that. You know, you go back a couple of years, they've done it a couple of times. They, they could have had Vita Vea at seven, moved down to 12 and picked up two defensive starters. They could have had, you know, you go back to Logan Hall and could have gotten him where they were at the end of the first round. But by moving down six spots, they pick up Kate Otten as a result of that. So, um, you know, especially with without a fourth round pick right now, um, there's kind of a, you don't want to have that patch where you go like a hundred picks without being involved in the draft. So 
I, I do think, um, again, if the right guy is there, if, if somebody falls to 19 that we don't expect, if there's a defensive front guy that everybody thought would be a top 10 pick and they're still there at 19, if, if anything, they may move up. If, if, if there's a guy that they absolutely like and it's only moving up two, three spots, that doesn't cost you but like a third day pick sometimes. So um, if anything, I would just say Jason Light's shown he's really flexible. Um, he'll move up, he'll move down. Um, kind of adjust to you know the board as they see it shaking out. Um, even if it means you might lose the guy you want, if there's somebody else you'd be happy with, and it nets another top 100 pick or something, that seems to be what he likes to do the most. Absolutely, yeah. Jason Light is nothing but flex or nothing if not flexible, um, as we've seen. Um, so kind of getting into fun prediction time um, with the <laughs> Baker Mayfield signing. Um, you know, the Bucks have two quarterbacks that could potentially start. Uh, Baker Mayfield or Kyle Trask, is there kind of a sense or a vibe that you're getting um, which has the advantage or which is the favorite to start moving forward for the Bucks? Yeah, I mean, it's not a huge financial commitment. I mean, it's just a $4 million base for Baker. And I mean, even if he does everything in the world, is still only $8 million. So it's not, oh, that guy has to start. I think the just the fact that he's a number one overall pick, that he's led teams to the playoffs, he's done so many things in the NFL that, that I mean, Kyle Trask might be able to do but you don't know. So that kind of now puts Kyle Trask back in that underdog role, not what he had going up against Tom Brady by any means. But um, I think the default, if you ask most people who would have that job, if, if there's a lean going into camp or going into off season workouts, it's, it's probably Baker. Um, I mean, the one advantage Trask had is that he was in this offense for two years, but now the offense is gone. So everybody, yeah. I think he knows the personnel. He certainly had two years to make an impression upon the coaches to know the tendencies and the strengths and weaknesses of the guys that he's throwing to. But uh, Baker will have, you know, four or five months here to, to figure out all those things. Um, so you don't know. I mean, it's one of those things where the nice thing about having two close quarterbacks or two quarterbacks you believe in is if, if one guy doesn't play well, you can go to the other one. I mean, that, that's not a situation the Bucks have been in for a while. You, you, you had – this team's really had nothing but large commitments to the quarterback for the last – seven years, I guess, whether it's a number one overall pick with Winston for five years or a guy like Tom Brady, who's not really going to take a seat to anybody. So that's eight years, actually. You have to go back to kind of the 13, 14 Glennon and Josh cool. Freeman or, or Josh McCown, um, where you didn't really have a quarterback um, here. You know, again, Baker Mayfield, I mean, if they can get Baker to play at 2020 levels, he took a team to the playoffs. He had 26 touchdowns against eight picks. That's that's almost a better year than Tom Brady had last year. Um, now the Baker Mayfield we saw the last two years with three different teams has been more picks and less touchdowns. So, yeah. um, you know, it's one of those where I don't, I don't know that it's um, an obvious lean to one or the other, but I do think it, if it's like 60, 40 or 55, 45, it probably leans in Baker's favor right now. And if I might, if I may chime in, Greg, I, I just have to ask because of, you know, Kyle Trask's experience actually playing on the field. Um, you know, do you really think it's 55, 45 or 60, 40? Just because, you know, personally for me, it's just, you know, the experience that Baker Mayfield has, you know, actually being on the field compared to Kyle Trask. Is this uh, a realistic battle or, or you also might be maybe thinking this might be a realistic battle just because of the situation? Maybe it's because oh, Kyle Trask has finally come to realize that it's it's really just him versus Baker now. You know, it's one thing when you have Tom Brady above you and you know, you know where you're where you stand. Of course, you're not going to try to take that starter spot, of course. But um, you know, with that situation, of course, uh, I, I I just have to ask. I don't say you know to me personally. I, I'm thinking maybe more like 70, 30, 65, 35. Maybe a little bit more different than you. Uh, just because, again, with the experience and all that, Greg, I just haven't seen much from Trask to show me that, you know, he's he's something. And even, you know, with all these guys that you've mentioned in the past, Mike Glennon and Freeman, uh, you know, we gave Freeman the chance whenever he needed it immediately when we drafted him. And then with Mike Glennon, I feel like he already racked up a bunch of experience behind uh, his couple past years. Uh, so I'm just trying to figure out, you know, um, is this, are, are you a little bit more hard-headed on this? Or is this a little bit more flexibility? Or do you possibly think that maybe something else may happen, you know, with this quarterback situation? Like something else besides those two? Yeah. 
No, they're not going to bring in another quarterback besides those two. Yeah, they, they don't have no cap. They don't have cap room. And yeah. I, I agree 100%. Something so no, they, I mean, they, they could, uh, if the right guy fell in the draft, they could, but I, I think they, they have two options they like at quarterback right now. I don't think they're going to sign any veteran. I mean, if they signed like a, a Drew Locke or something, it would just be in like a Gabbard type role where he knows the offense yeah. and he's third quarterback or something okay. like that. What, what Kyle Trask hasn't had at all in two years here are, are meaningful reps. It just, I mean, when you're the third quarterback or even the second quarterback to Tom Brady, you're not really getting a lot of practice reps. Um, you know, in training camp, there's four quarterbacks and they rotate those guys through, but Trask never really had time with the ones, time with the best receivers, those kind of things, the same way you would if it were an open competition. So I think they'll, um, they'll at least start things out that way, where I think there'll be reps for both guys. I think they you know, have told Kyle Trash they want to give him a shot at the job. It, it doesn't mean that because they gave Baker Mayfield $4 million and he's done it before, he's got the job. I mean, I think he definitely has a a confidence that comes with having done it. I mean, he's had four seasons where he's he's been a full-time quarterback. And, and the, the body of work where, you know, you don't necessarily need to get the best of those four for it to be something they'd be comfortable with. But I think it's it's something that um, – Everything with Kyle Trash right now is, is theoretical. It's all like, we think he could do this. We think he could do that. He did this in college. He did it well. I mean, he, he had great numbers in college. We just don't know how that translates to operating and understanding an NFL offense, let alone a new offense. Um, you know, Kyle Trask has shown he can, I mean, he didn't do anything at Florida his first two years, and he threw 43 touchdowns in a season. He, he didn't start in high school much at all. So, I mean, he's, if anybody can show that, they can learn on the sidelines and learn without having um, actual reps in games is called Trask. So I think that that shouldn't be undervalued here. Um, you know, Baker Mayfield, Mayfield wouldn't have come here unless he had reasonable confidence of, of getting the job. The reason you come to Tampa is because it's a job that does not have someone staking real claim to it. It's kind of like Washington and Sam Howell. They can say Sam Howell's their guy, He's still a, a third day, third round draft pick who's barely <laughs> played any football at all. So it, it's kind of like the best version of what you would expect Sam Howell to be is going to be pretty close to what Jacoby Brissett is. So then the yeah. decision, wow, I mean, do we like the upside of Kyle Trask enough that we'll give him that chance and we'll try to see if he can be better than that? That's what he has to sell them on. Because, I mean, Baker Mayfield probably has more um, – it's like you can still say upside because they're getting him for $4 million. And he's only 27 years old. So this is different from if, if it was like Gabbard, he was up against where it's like Gabbard's been in the league 10 years. You pretty much know what Blaine Gabbard's going to be. Um, Mayfield, there's, there's reasonable confidence that if you can get what someone else got out of him just, you know, two, three years ago over a full season. Um, and Baker Mayfield took a franchise that hadn't been in the playoffs in 18 years and got him there and won a game in the playoffs. So that's, that's a little bit more to bring into a, an open competition than, than most people, especially when you're going up against a guy who's the single best thing Kyle Trask has going for him is that they put a second round draft pick into him and they've had two years. He, he's done all the right things in terms of putting in time, showing he is dedicated and learns well from others, but it's all, it's all in practice. You know, it'd, it'd be one of those where if you uh, had read a lot about something it's kind of like you, you can read about being a pilot, right? And you can do simulations and you can be outstanding at that and have all the right responses and reflexes until you're in the air and and, and the, the plane is in your hands. You don't know how you'll handle that. So I would think they do enough to give Kyle Trask a chance to show that. Um, but he, I think, would probably have to actively outplay Baker Mayfield. Maybe they both get reps with the first team in, in preseason. Maybe they don't. I don't know. But I think... He, he would probably have to actively grab that away from the person who's the more logical choice. Yeah, and I agree with you 100%. And then just kind of last question to wrap it up. I know it's super yeah. early in the in the offseason, but who, who do you have as your favorite in the NFC to, to kind of take over and control the very up-in-the-air division? Yeah, it, it might be like the hardest division in the NFL to pick right now. I mean, they had one game separate first and fourth last year, you know, and you have every team has had major changes. I mean, obviously the, the Bucs had started losing Tom Brady, but they didn't lose quite as much as we expect them to defensively. For them to get Jamel Dean back and, and Levante David back is a better scenario than most. The Saints have added Derek Carr. We don't know how that's – I mean, literally 
in the 10 minutes since we've been talking, the Saints have added Jamal Williams, who scored 17 touchdowns last year. So now they have a really good replacement for Alvin Kamara in place if, if Kamara's gone for a chunk of this year. Um, Saints took a hit on defense and lost Davenport and Anyamata and Shai Tuttle and Caden Ellis. Um, Atlanta has spent a lot, but still basically has, you know, what will either be, in terms of their options at quarterback, could be Taylor Heineke, could be Desmond Ritter. That's a lot like Mayfield and Trask. It's not going to put a lot of fear yeah. in opponents. Um, Carolina, even harder to peg because we don't know who that quarterback's going to be. They're going to have a brand new rookie quarterback, which might be awesome in a year or two, but doesn't necessarily take in week one. So all, all four teams are kind of in flux. Um, you have new coaches. You have coaches that are in danger of not being there in terms of guys like Arthur Smith or, or Dennis Allen if they don't perform well. Todd Bowles is probably in that same boat. Um, so it's really hard to pick. If I had to guess right now, I mean, I, I don't – it's kind of like Carolina. If Carolina takes Stroud, okay, he seems a little bit more ready than if it took Richardson. But to to try and peg the year one success of a rookie quarterback-driven team is really hard. So yeah. uh, the Saints have done a lot to help themselves by adding somebody like Carr, by ne- – you know, holding on to Michael Thomas when we didn't think they would probably keep him. But again, we don't know if that's 150 catch Michael Thomas or the guy that <laughs> for all but about five games the last couple of years. So it's a really hard one to peg. I, you can't really think of the Bucks as favorites right now because they they lose a lot and they will lose yeah. a lot of experience in, in having just the, the fear and the uh, intimidation that is Tom Brady as your starting quarterback, you know. So, no, it's wide open. I think nine or ten wins still probably wins this division yeah. right now. I think anybody's going to go bonkers and win 13 games here. Uh, it'll be better than it was last year. It's not like the team with the losing record is going to go back. Um, but, yeah, it, it's it's really hard to figure out. And so much of the stuff is happening in real time where you're processing. Uh, the Saints lost this guy. They added this guy. I mean, the Saints added two D tackles today. And we don't know as much uh, about them. But they're graded out pretty similar to the guys they lost, you know, and, and there's probably still more moves coming. We don't know uh, cuts that had to be made to pull these moves off today or signings that won't happen because of what they did today. Uh, but right now, the best thing I can say about the NFC South is that it's going to be really tight and actually probably pretty entertaining given some of the new faces involved. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for your time, Greg. We know we, you got to get out of here, um, but we really appreciate you ha- us, uh, you coming on to the show um, and hope you have a great rest of your night. And thanks again. No problem. You guys take care. All right. Well, that was Greg Allman. Um, I hope you all enjoyed that. Thank you so much, Greg, if you're listening, for joining us. Um, he is he is Bucks football for me personally, just from the journalism yeah. perspective. Um, you know, like I said, growing up him, Rick Stroud, guys like that, um, just reading their columns every week about the Bucks. Um, so it was really a, a truly a pleasure to have him on the show. Um, what were y'all, what were y'all's thoughts on having Greg on the show? Zach, we'll start with you since you, you secured the bag, you got him on here. <laughs> no, I mean, uh, to be honest, it, probably like one of the most starstruck moments, like without being like a, an athlete that I've met. So, For sure. uh, you touched on it perfectly. He's to me, he is the Bucks reporter that I've grown up with. So uh, huge, huge thanks to him for even, I mean, re- like reach returning my message on, on Twitter. I cannot thank him enough. I think that shows how just much he loves the Bucks football and really the NFC South in general. Now that he's, he's over that. So I, uh, I'm just in awe at it still. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like like you said, just uh, he was. The, he, if you're a Bucks fan, you follow Greg Allman on Twitter. Like that's just exactly. Kind of, uh, Musab, how about you? You you got you got you know you got any thoughts on Greg Allman being on the show? Uh, I mean, for me, man, you know he's one of those. Yeah, like you know Bucks OGs when it comes to the media. Um, you know, as you mentioned already, Carter. You know, you, you see his name everywhere as a Buccaneers fan, and. Uh, it's always nice seeing, you know, like, uh, you know, someone like him's experience and, you know, to him to kind of drop this knowledge and, you know, also his hot takes, you know, uh, I think, you know, everyone also has their own beliefs and everything, you know, everything and all that as well. But um, it's, it's always nice to, you know, talk to someone who this is really everything for them or not everything, you know, obviously, you know, you know, the man's got a whole family back at home as well, but, you know, the thing is, you know, this is what he does. And this ain't what he's been doing for the last year or two. You know, he's been doing this for a while. So it's always nice to know that, you know, he's been following it for a while. 
and uh, it's it's just nice knowing, you know, and always talking to another Buccaneers kind of, you know, um, you know, experienced kind of, you know, fan watcher, or whatever, you know, whatever you want to call him, a columnist. Uh, you know, he's he's phenomenal. I, I got a lot of respect for him, and you know, I, I still remember those days when I started elementary school and I first moved to Florida. You know, you see those reporters, you know, little hot takes in the newspaper. And I do remember seeing Greg Allman's name up there, of course. And especially, you know, now that I've been following the Bucks more than ever and ever, you know, you see Greg Allman's name as well. Um, and, you know, he's up there and it was it's really been awesome. And it was really cool. Seriously, cool experience. As Zach Blaine just mentioned, uh, it was it was a starstruck moment. You know what I'm saying? You know, I'm ripping the Bucks gear and I'm thinking, man, this is this is really it. You know, I'm talking to one of the you know, Bucks reporters, you know, the guy has been following the Buccaneers for a while. So real neat, real neat. So big shout out to Zach. And uh, again, big shout out to Greg Allman for joining us on this show. Absolutely. Yeah. Can't thank Greg enough. Um, thank him for his time and just for, for helping us out. Um, but now getting on to more Bucks news, because um, there's a lot of it. I mean, we won't even get to the whole thing in this episode. Um, you know, it, it's been a lot and I'm sure we'll get more as the week progresses now that free agency has started. But another big storyline was Levante David is back. Um, there were kind of some question marks just because, you know, he's a really good linebacker. He's he's one of the best in the NFL. And, you know, the Bills lost Tremaine Edmonds to the Bears. Um, the Eagles lost TJ Edwards to the Bears as well. Um, so, you know, there are some really good teams out there that could that could have used his services. Um, but instead, luckily, the Bucks were able to work out a deal with him, bring him back for another year. Um, I'd love to see him retire as a Buck. He just he is that Bucks defense for the past decade. Um, so what what do you all think about this signing? I mean, obviously, it's super exciting. But um, does this even push even more the need to kind of address the offense in the draft just because you know it's great to bring these guys back and, and it's going to be great for the team um but that offense is still in shambles so now that levante david is back how does this change the draft perspectives perspective zach we'll start with you uh, i mean again i touched on it when we talked about the the offensive side or the the cornerback side sorry yeah, well, Dean, I, I, don't think, I don't think that it changes what we are going to do um because keep in mind, he's 33, I think, right? He's, he's up right. there. He's up there. No, he's up there. So he's not going to be playing for another five, ten years. Like, it's not going to happen. For sure. Realistically, I could see this being his last season. Um, so with all of that, in my mind, we still need to find a replacement. Does that mean we go first round inside linebacker this year? Maybe not. But I wouldn't be surprised to see us still focus on defense just as much as offense in, in this upcoming draft. I think this is probably the most important draft to the future of our franchise in a while. Yeah, I mean, that's a great point, um, especially because not just Levante David, Devin White's in the last year of his deal. Yeah. And they're not going to lock him up for an extended period of time because mm -hmm. he's going to get that TJ Edwards, Tremaine Edmonds type of money most likely next season. Um, so, you know, they're going to have to let him go. I don't know that they bring back Levante David, like you said, for another year after this. Even if he does continue playing, I don't know that it'll be for a Bucks uniform after this season. Yeah. So, you know, like you mentioned, they still need to focus on that position because it is very much going to be in flux uh, after this year. Um, Musab, how about you? Maybe you feel differently. Maybe you think, you know, maybe the Bucks don't even need to draft a linebacker this year. Wait until next year. Give, give, push that can along. You know, let it be next year's problem. No, I think I think we need to focus on the defense, of course, as well. But for me, I mean, you know, priority goes towards the offensive line, uh, and even with the defensive line that you mentioned as well, uh, Carter. Um, that's kind of what I'm looking at right now. Um, in the secondary, those are the kind of three kind of positions I'm focused on right now. I'm open to you know hidden gems, you know, if some special individual is still not picked yet, you know, we're looking at the later rounds by all means, I, I think it's an understandable move, but you know, in, in the couple first rounds, I'm looking at offensive line, defensive line. Uh, I'm looking at, you know, DBs, um, you know, it's going to be a little bit more of a, I don't know if it's really a hot take, but you know, I, I wouldn't mind maybe a little bit more of a hidden gem kind of tight end, you know, cause I don't know. I don't really know what's going on with the whole tight end situation as well. Okay, right. So I, think, I think we need to start a drinking game for every time Musab says he wants a hidden gem. 
<laughs> I like it. I, re I really do like it. It's it's hysterical to me. It, but you're right. I think that that's going to be a big part is finding successful late round picks this this draft. For sure. Yeah. I mean, it's easy to make a first round pick. You know, it's easy to even make a second round pick. Um, it's the like you said, it's those late rounds that really separate good teams from great teams, because, you know, like. Like I said, it's easy to make a first or second round pick. Those guys, those are studs. You know, it's it's easy to find those guys. Um, but yeah, the six, the fifth, sixth, seventh rounds, that's really where teams make their money. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's that's really gonna be huge moving forward. Um, so I mean, you know, like you said, Musav says hidden gems a lot, but it's true. You know, that's that's just the nature of the NFL draft. You're gonna have to find some guys that aren't necessarily you know, hugely talked about to be successful just because those guys that are hugely talked about are hugely talked about for a reason. They're going to be picked up. Um, so especially in the Bucks position, they're not picking early. Um, so yeah, it's, it's definitely, it's definitely going to be interesting to see how they proceed moving forward with the draft. Um, but you know that we're kind of nearing the end of our episode. Um, we had Greg Allman on. We had we, it was a great, great week for Bucks football, honestly, um, compared to where I thought we were going to be. Um, yeah. Yeah. This, um, you know, just looking at this roster, I mean, you know, it's it's not looking bad. I mean, it's still not looking great. It's not a Super Bowl. <laughs> but but we, we brought back our two biggest needs, our two biggest free agents. So I, I think that it, it, for you to not call it a success or at least better than what we expected, I think we'd be wrong. Absolutely. Yeah, I'd call this – pretty much best, best case scenario for the Bucks. Yeah. Barring Tom Brady coming out of retirement, this is probably the best case scenario for the start to the Bucks. Yeah. Off. Um, now they just need to sign Ezekiel Elliott, right? I mean, that's, that's, the I mean, I'm telling you, <laughs> it's gonna happen. and then next week we're going to get on here and I'm going to say, Carter, Remember when I said we were going to sign a Zeke Elliott? <laughs> right. yeah, you're you're going to tell me to shove it, and I'll deserve yeah, pretty it. much. Just like you tell all those other teams, I'm telling right. you. <laughs> right. Well, anyway, um, thank you all for listening. Thank you, listeners, for listening. Um, without you all, we would just be sitting here arguing about Ezekiel Elliott. Um, uh, hit the like and subscribe button wherever you're listening to us from. Also, feel free to follow us on social media, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at RBR Sports. We're all over the place. Um, you know, definitely take a peek. Um, and, uh, you know, as always, go Bucks. Go Bucks. Thank you for tuning into this presentation by RBLR Sports. On your way out of the stadium, please remember to like and subscribe.